Welcome back. This is Lesson 3 for How to Compose Music 101, brought to you by artofcomposing.com. Today we're going to be looking at musical form. Specifically, you're going to learn the three different levels of musical form, the different types of cadences and when to use them, and how to write a solid musical period. I like to picture musical form on three different levels. The first level is small form. At the small form level is where the music is conceived, and this is where you get the basic themes that will be developed. At the small form level, you're looking at motives, basic ideas, sentences, periods, small binary form, and small ternary form. Here is an example of a musical period, which is what we're going to be looking at a little bit later in this lesson. At this level, you also have the things that happen around the themes. Things like introductions, which are before the theme, or post-cadential functions, which are after the theme. The next level that I like to think about form is the large form level. At the large level, you start to hear terms like sonata, rondo, and concerto forms. At this level, we're mostly concerned with the way that the small forms are developed melodically, rhythmically, and most importantly, harmonically. In the third level, we're primarily concerned with the way those large forms interact in things like symphonies, concertos, and operas. Like I said earlier, in today's lesson, we're going to be looking at the musical period. The period, in its elementary form, is an eight-bar theme consisting of two four-bar phrases, the first one being called the antecedent and the second one being called the consequent. Listen to this example of a musical period. Most people who have studied music theory have come across a definition of the period, but I've found that most of these definitions don't give you good guidance on how to actually write one. The main feature that most of these theory classes and books talk about is that the antecedent ends in a weak cadence, normally a half cadence, which we'll talk about in a moment, and the consequent ends in an authentic cadence. A cadence is a specific way of ending a phrase harmonically. There are several different types of cadences, but today we're only going to talk about the half cadence and the authentic cadence. The half cadence ends on a 5 chord. It's very rare to see a 5-7 chord. It also is normally preceded by a 2 chord in first inversion or by something called a cadential 6-4. A cadential 6-4 is a 1-6-4 chord, so a 1 chord in second inversion, but it's easier to look at it like this. You've got the fifth note, the dominant, and above it you have a sixth and a fourth. If you're looking at it in C major, you've got a G as the root, and then you've got an E on top and a C just below that. This resolves into a dominant chord triad. An authentic cadence ends on the one chord and is preceded by a five, or more commonly, a five seven chord. Here's an example of an authentic cadence. Now you may have noticed something different about the two chord in that example. The two chord was in first inversion. If you remember inversions from the previous lesson, you know that the main point of using them is to have a smoother bass line. Well with the two chord in first inversion, now you can have an F in the bass move to a G and then to a C. It's a little bit smoother than having a D to a G to a C, although that's pretty common too. Another thing that was different is the five chord had an extra note. This note, the F, is known as the seventh. It's built by adding one more additional third to the G major triad, still using C major diatonic harmony. Listen to the difference between a plain major triad and a seventh chord. The seventh, if you were to invert it, would only be a whole step away 
from the root of the chord. This gives it a certain dissonance. Our definition of dissonance at this point is a note that wants to resolve or move to another note. Specifically, the F has a tendency to move to E. So the seventh of the dominant, which is also the fourth of the tonic, wants to move to the third of the tonic. This is a very strong relationship, and you see it all over music. Couple this with the third of G, or the third of the dominant, which wants to move back to tonic, because it is actually the leading tone of tonic, and you get this sound. So let's look at composing our period. As I said before, the period is made up of an antecedent phrase and a consequent phrase. Each one of these phrases can be broken down even further. The antecedent phrase is made up of a basic idea, sound familiar, and a contrasting idea. The contrasting idea is nothing more than another basic idea. It gets its contrast by introducing distinctly different motives. It also differs from the basic idea in that the basic idea has a tonic prolongation progression, meaning that its primary harmony is tonic harmony, which may be extended with neighbor chords or inversions. The contrasting idea, on the other hand, has a cadential progression. That means that it's either going to be a half cadence or an authentic cadence. Composing a contrasting idea is the exact same process as composing a basic idea. Just make sure it conforms to the harmony that you want. For this lesson, I'm going to start with a basic idea that I composed in lesson one. Next, I'm going to compose a contrasting idea over a cadential 6-4 harmony. Remember, at the end of an antecedent phrase, we have to have a half cadence. Sometimes you can have an imperfect authentic cadence, but I won't go into that for now. A quick tip for composing your cadences, normally at a cadence, there's also a short pause or stop in the music. Now this doesn't mean that all of the music stops. It normally just means that there's a pause in the melody or the surface rhythm. Listen to this example. Now let's continue with the consequent. The consequent starts off with the basic idea one more time. So this part's pretty easy. Just copy the first two bars again. The second two bars of the consequent phrase have a new contrasting idea. Now you could compose a completely new contrasting idea, which is done pretty often, or you could make some changes to the original contrasting idea. The important thing is the cadence. The cadence has to be a stronger cadence than the antecedent phrase. Normally, this is done with a perfect, authentic cadence. We're going to write our new contrasting idea over a specific chord progression. It's the 2-6-5-7-1 chord progression. This is one of the most common chord progressions in all of music, not just classical, but jazz, rock, and pop as well. When composing an idea over more than one chord, the same rules apply. Just make sure you're using the right chord tones over the harmony. Now, there's one specific thing that I want you to do. This is not an absolute requirement, but it is if you want to write a perfect authentic cadence. The last two notes in the melody will either be 2-1 or 7-8. This means that in C major, it's either going to be D-C or B-C. The reason is authentic cadences come in two different types. The first one, perfect authentic cadences, end with tonic in the melody. The second type, imperfect authentic cadences, and with another chord tone in the melody, so either 3 or 5. One last thing. If you have a very busy melody with lots of notes, you want to end your period with something called liquidation. Liquidation is basically stripping away characteristic motives from your melody and giving it a plainer feeling. This allows your music to kind of relax at the end. Now let's hear the entire period. Okay, so that's the period. Be sure to print out the worksheets that are located below this video. In the next lesson, we're going to be covering the sentence. 
the next type of small musical form. If you found this video through YouTube or through a friend and you want to have access to the complete course, go to artofcomposing.com and sign up for the newsletter.